you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Feel free to use the table of contents in the beginning if you need to. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Arlington and Moco and Prince William and Loudoun, as well as others of you who are joining online. It is always good to be together around God's Word. I want to tell you from the start, one of the most overwhelming emotions that I experience every single Sunday. So I look out across this room full of people at other locations and then think about different people online. And then I, I even think about people who will listen to what I'm saying right now, maybe later this week, or later this month, or a year or two, or even farther down into the future than that. And I think about all the different things that each person who's listening right now is walking through in your life, and specific needs you have in your life or specific challenges you're walking through in your life, or your family, in your relationships, in your work. Like some of you right now, as you're listening, really need strength. You feel really tired. Amen. And basically like you're at the end of yourself, maybe at the end of your rope. Others of you need peace. You're surrounded right now by what seems like constant wrestling with this or that, and you just want rest. Some of you need wisdom in decisions you're facing. Others of you need comfort amidst pain. Some of you need healing physically or amidst other hurts. Some of you need joy for some of you right now, every day seems like a fight for joy. And some of you feel like you haven't had it for a while. Others of you need love. Some of you, even in a crowd of people, feel alone. Like nobody else really understands. And some of you, if you're honest, some days feel like, yeah, all the above <laughs> is what I need combined. And, and then, even if you're not walking through specific challenges in your life right now, even if things are actually going great, the reality is none of us knows what needs or challenges might arise this next week. So whenever I think about this, it's, it's overwhelming. And here's where it drives me, genuinely. One, it drives me to pray for you, to pray for members, people who are attending this church just every day, throughout the day, and particularly as I'm preparing to stand in front of you today to intercede on your behalf, asking for God's help in your lives. And then second, it drives me to love this word. Because with all these needs in your lives and all that you're going through, the last thing I think is, well, I know just what to say to help every single person in all that you're walking through. Like, in and of myself, I, I've got the answers for you today. I'm glad you came. I, I definitely don't think that. Instead, I come to this word from the God who knows every need represented in our lives. Amen. Better than we even know our needs. And the God who knows everything that's coming in our lives this week. And he is with us right now. And he is about to speak to us in the next few moments through a word that I know has the power to speak personally to every single one of us and every single need we have. Amen. What an awesome reality. I would even take that a step further and say this word has power to speak to needs that you don't even realize you have. So before I read this word, I just want to pray for all of us, and I mean us because I've got needs and challenges too, so we're all in the same boat 
Which leads right into this story that we're about to look at, a story that may be familiar to some of you of Jesus' disciples in a boat. And no, we're not going to sing. Uh, but before we read it, I just want to pause all together and ask God in the next few moments, wherever we're listening right now, to speak to the deepest needs in our lives by his spirit through his word in each of our lives. So can we just pray, God, we want to hear from you and we need to hear from you. We have so many different things going on in our lives and and we don't know what's coming later today or later this week or this month in our lives. And so you do, you know all these things. And we trust you, love us, and you've brought us even to this moment to hear from you. So move me out of the way, I pray. Speak by your spirit through your word in the next few moments and take your word and apply it to each and every person that is listening right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Okay, so let's hear the word of God. If you haven't been here the last few weeks as we've been walking through Mark, let me give you the setup. Jesus sent his disciples out one day on a short-term mission trip, and we were reminded over the last couple of weeks that we, as followers of Jesus, are living on a short-term mission trip in this world until we get to heaven, sharing the gospel wherever we go. I had a great conversation with a guy from Eritrea this last week about how we can know we have eternal life, not based on our works, but based on God's grace. And we're going to follow up, Lord willing, in the days to come. Had another conversation with a guy from Vietnam. It was so good. So his, uh, his English wasn't that great. Uh, it was a lot better than my Vietnamese, so we were sticking with English, but uh, it was so good because I, was, I remember back during COVID when we were doing ministry all across the city, we were doing ministry, giving out food and, and, and doing different things in one particular Vietnamese community, and a Vietnamese news station had picked up that story and done a video piece on it, so I was able to pull up that video piece and play it for him, and I was just hoping whatever they were saying was positive about our church family, um, but I was figuring it was because it's showing, showing pictures of like giving out food and loving people. So it was like, listen to this. And God used your serving during COVID to open the door for me to be able to share the gospel with this guy uh, this week. So all this to say, church family, let's keep sharing the gospel, the good news of God's love in Jesus wherever we go. Invite people to come on Sundays. If you are visiting with us today, we are so glad you're here. We don't think it's an accident that you're here. So in all of our songs and our prayers and what I'm about to walk us through in God's word, we want more than anything for you to know God's love for you in Jesus. For you to hear today that you and I and all of us have been created for relationship with God. We're made to know and walk with God. The problem in all of our lives and in the world is we've turned aside from God and his ways to ourselves and our own ways, and we're separated from God. And if we die in the state of separation from God, we will spend eternity in judgment because of our sin against God. But the good news of the Bible is that God has not left us alone in this state. God has come to us in the person of Jesus, and he has done what none of us could ever do. He's lived the life we couldn't live, a life with no sin and then, even though he had no sin for which to die, he chose to die on a cross to pay the price for sin. And then he rose from the grave in victory over death. So he lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserve to die. And then he conquered the enemy we could not conquer. So that anyone, anywhere who puts their trust in Jesus, who repents and believes in the gospel, turns from their sin and trusts in Jesus and his love, will be forgiven of all your sin and restored to relationship with God forever and ever. So you can know this reality, eternal life with God today by faith in Jesus. We invite you to place your faith in Jesus. And then when you do, to join us in pointing other people to God's love in Jesus. So, all right, now we come back to the setup of the story. So Jesus' disciples get back from the short-term mission trip and they debrief, much like we did last week. And then Jesus includes them in a miracle of feeding over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. 
And we know, based on another account of this story from one, one of Jesus' other disciples, John, that right after Jesus fed all these people, they were ready to crown Jesus king. Mark it down. People love free food. <laughs> but Jesus knew it was not God the Father's plan for him to be crowned king in that way at that time. So he wanted to get the disciples away from that crowd as fast as possible. That's where we pick up in Mark chapter 6, verse 45. I'll have it on the screen if you don't have a Bible, but follow along with me. So here is what happens next. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded. They did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Oh, there's so much here and so much that relates to the needs in our lives, the challenges we walk through. So I'm going to use this imagery of a storm on the sea with wind and waves to represent the challenges that you might be walking through right now. And I just want you to hear straight from God what he is saying to you in the middle of any, every storm in your life. So God's word to you in the storm. Or if you're not walking through storms right now, maybe to write these things down and hide them in your heart so you can have them ready to pull out for for whenever the next storm comes. So here's what God is saying in his word. In the middle of the storm, first and foremost, Jesus, Jesus calls you into storms. Jesus calls you into storms. So did you notice from the very beginning of this passage, I'll turn this off for a minute. For the, well, maybe not. Let's, all right, we're just going to stick with that for a minute. Okay, Jesus calls you into storms. Did you notice from the very beginning that Jesus is the one who made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side? In other words, Jesus sent his disciples into what would turn into a storm. So that probably happened around 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night once it had gotten dark and people had eaten. Then later in verse 48, Mark tells us that Jesus came out to them on the sea about the fourth watch of the night. So that's anywhere between 3, 4, 5, maybe 6 o'clock in the morning. So the picture is these disciples were on this boat for at least six hours if not 9, 10, 11 hours, by themselves making headway painfully with the wind against them. Matthew, in his account of this story, says they were being beaten by the waves, all because they had done what Jesus told them to do. Because they obeyed Jesus. Jesus led them into a storm. Now, I want to pause and just let's be clear. There are definitely times in our lives when we face challenges, storms, because we disobey Jesus. There are always consequences to sin and disobedience in our lives. Storms follow sin. But at the same time, there are also times when we face storms not because of our disobedience to Jesus, but actually because of our obedience to him. And we should not be surprised by this. This is all over the Bible. 
We just finished reading Job in our church's Bible reading plan who experienced suffering because of his obedience to God, his blamelessness before God, his fear of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves in a fiery furnace because they obeyed and worshiped God. Daniel found himself in a den of lions because he was seeking God. Read about prophet after prophet in the Old Testament. You don't come away with the impression that the pathway to the smooth, trouble-free life is obedience to God and his word. Actually, the opposite. Then when you turn the pages into the New Testament, you see these disciples. We were talking about this recently. They were all persecuted. You realize that they all suffered. Most of them died as a result of following Jesus. Paul knew this. We just finished reading 1 and 2 Corinthians. Today, we're starting Philippians, where Paul is writing from prison because he knew, he wrote it out specifically in his second letter to Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be, anybody know? Will be persecuted. Like, the picture in the New Testament is clear, and of course, we're not surprised because this is Jesus who died on a cross because of his obedience to God the Father, And who said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to experience what I experienced. So no Christian should be under any illusion that following Jesus leads to a smooth, trouble-free life in this world. When you signed up to follow Jesus, you signed up for storms. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Just think about all that Jesus calls us to, a life of making disciples among all the nations. I spent last time last Sunday night with other members of our church family listening to an amazing sister from this church family, single, who has moved to the Middle East to spread the gospel. She's back for just a little while. It's about to go back in a couple of weeks, and it has been really hard for her. She's experiencing all kinds of storms for following Jesus because you can't make disciples of all the nations without signing up for storms. You want to avoid storms? Don't make disciples of all the nations, particularly in hard countries where there's so much opposition to the gospel. In a similar way, if we're going to care for the poor or oppressed, if we're going to step into foster care and adoption and care for widows or sojourners or refugees. Storms will come. We have brothers and sisters in Ukraine right now who are following Jesus straight into storms. A group of men and women and students out at PW gathered this last Wednesday night specifically to pray for Ukraine and our partners there. And at that exact time, these pastors and churches that we personally know had sent some men into Maripol to help people get out of that city. And they were literally dodging bullets as people at PW were praying. You don't rescue refugees in Ukraine without storms. And as a side note, one of the church leaders there said, sent a message back saying, we felt your prayers on our skin like an amazing hand of protection was upon us. Do not underestimate for a second the power of prayer for brothers and sisters on the other side of the world during these days and during any day. All this to say, the picture in the Bible is clear. When you follow Jesus, don't be surprised when the storm comes. Just because you are making headway painfully and the wind is against you doesn't mean you've deviated from God's path. These things actually mean you are directly in God's path. And sometimes we know the reason for the storm, other times we don't. I'm sure these disciples were wondering why Jesus sent them into these rough waters in ways that we parallel how we often wonder why God. We talked about this in Job a few weeks ago. We don't always know why. Remember what we said? Amidst all our questions about why, remember that God is all wise. That God knows what he's doing. And Jesus knew what he was doing here. That leads right into this next truth for you from God. Jesus calls you into storms and Jesus sees you in the storm. Jesus sees you in the storm. Did you notice verse 48? Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully. That the wind was against them. Jesus saw. Let's just meditate 
for a moment on the simple significance of this one word, these three letters. Jesus saw, Jesus knew exactly what was going on with these disciples. He saw where they started. He saw where they were now. And he saw where they were going in a way that they couldn't even see. He saw and knew things they did not know. Jesus always sees with a perspective that is far wider and far truer than our perspective. And this is particularly true when we're walking through storms. We see the wind and the waves around us. Many times that's all we can see, which causes fear to rise up in us. Like, what's going to happen? The wind and the waves cause confusion. Why is this happening? The wind and the waves cause question. How, how do I get through this? But here's Jesus on the side of the mountain, and he sees and knows it all in a way the disciples didn't see and couldn't know. In ways that you and I, when we're in the storm, can't see and don't know. Didn't we see this in the book of Job? Remember how the whole story of Job is told to us in a way that even we see what Job doesn't see. In that first chapter, before anything bad happens, we see this conversation in heaven between God and Satan. This angelic assembly surrounding God that ultimately leads to Job's storms. But at no point does Job know anything about that conversation. In the whole story, all he sees is the storm around him. That's all he knows. But even you and I, as we read the book, we have a different perspective. We know where the story starts. We can even flip to the last chapter to see where it ends. Which means we have a whole different perspective that helps us understand what's happening to Job. We know that God honors Job. It's holy. We know that Job will eventually be restored. But Job doesn't know any of that. And that's part of the point of the book. Whenever we walk through storms, we always, always, always have a limited perspective. Now, I'm not saying that any time we suffer, we can conclude that God has had a conversation with Satan and heaven about our lives like he did about Job. But the reality is, no matter what happens in our storms, our perspective is always partial. It's limited. And part of the point of the book of Job is to remind us there's a whole nother perspective, the perspective of the God who sees and knows all. Just imagine the broader, wider, truer, more complete perspective of Job's story. There stands Satan before God, surrounded by 10,000 angels, Satan accusing Job of false worship, saying God has to pay people to worship him. And God responds and says, you may do all these things to Job. And Satan does. Satan strikes down Job's oxen and donkeys, his sheep, his camels, his servants, and then his children. And a hush comes over heaven. As God, Satan, and 10,000 angels wait in silence to see Job's response. And Job, falls on his knees in worship, looks up to heaven and says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And totally unbeknownst to Job, at that moment, 20,000 angels' arms shoot into the air and 10,000 angel voices shout, worthy is the God of Job as Satan goes running out of God's presence. That perspective changes the whole story. But that's the point. Job couldn't see that. And when you and I walk through storms, we never see the whole story. And we won't see it completely this side of heaven, but we can trust Jesus sees. He sees. He knows in the middle of the storm, Jesus sees you. He knows you. And he sees and knows every other person and every single detail in ways you could never see or know. 
Hide this away in your heart. When you struggle to see him, know that he sees you. Now, that doesn't make everything easy, which leads to this next truth from this story for you from God. Jesus prays for you amidst the storm. Jesus prays for you amidst the storm. What a picture. In verse 46, here are the disciples being tossed around in the middle of the sea. And while they're in the storm out there, Jesus is on the mountainside over here on his knees praying. Doubtless, at least in part, interceding for them and their faith amidst the storm they're facing. What a picture. It gives in your mind when we walk through storms, we find ourselves praying all the time. God, please help me in this way. Please help in that way. And we should pray like that. But at the same time, stop and realize Jesus is praying for you. You say, what do you mean? Jesus is praying for me? Go to Romans 8 with me. I'll put it up here on the screen. Right after the Bible talks about suffering in this world and how God is working for good, even in our suffering, the Bible says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but willingly gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who was raised from the dead and is at the right hand of God. And he is what? He's interceding for us. (laughs) Do you realize the wonder of this? That in the middle of your storm, all around you, Jesus is interceding for you? For all the things you need? I can think, think about, I, didn't, I don't have it up here, but what the Bible says right after this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or insert your storm? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, it's all your needs. You need, you need strength. You need hope. You need peace. You need comfort. You need courage. You need wisdom. You need faith on days when faith is hard to come by. You just need help to make it through the day. With all those needs, Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, interceding for everything you need. It'll change your perspective on storms in this world when you realize that the Son of God is in heaven, interceding on your behalf ready to give you everything you need at every moment you need it. Which leads right into this next truth. So Jesus prays for you amidst the storm, and Jesus is our greatest need in the storm. Jesus is our greatest need in the storm. So make the connection here. Just mention all kinds of things we need in the storm. Strength, hope, peace, comfort, courage, wisdom, faith, help. I could go on and on and on. But this story is specifically told in such a way that we might see our greatest need is not ultimately these things. Our greatest need is ultimately him. Let me show it to you. Verse 48. It's so interesting. So they're making their headway painfully. The wind is against them. Jesus comes to them walking on the sea. And it says he meant to pass by them. What is that about? I I read that, I'm like, sounds like Jesus was going for a stroll in the water and like trying to sneak past him. (laughs) Almost kind of laughing at him, huh? Ha ha, I can walk. You guys are struggling. And then he's trying to sneak by and they're like, oh, that's him. And he's like, oh, no. (laughs) All right, I'll come over and help you out. Like That's kind of what, that's the picture you have in your mind, I think. I don't think that's what this... (laughs) It's going on here. I mean, for one, Jesus, Jesus could have took a variety of routes across that sea where it had been clear that they couldn't see him. So I don't think he was trying to avoid his disciples. And this is where I want you to see the beauty of God's word and the way God's word speaks really intentionally with this language. He meant to pass by them. So that language actually takes us back all the way in the Old Testament, 
the times when God's people were in difficult days and storms. And God, in the storm, revealed himself to his people in greater ways than they had ever seen before. And the language it uses is passing by them. So watch this. Moses, he was experiencing all kinds of storms trying to lead God's people. And he said, God, I need to see you in the middle of this. I need to see you. And listen to how God responded. Exodus 33, 19, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. The Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. So this language of passing by is the way God spoke about revealing his glory to Moses. And you look at the very next chapter, listen to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. So see this picture of God's glory and his attributes, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children, the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. He saw God in a way he had never seen him before as the Lord passed before him. That's the language. Then interestingly, so fast forward to Elijah's life. At a moment that he was so discouraged and depressed, he wanted to die. He did not want to go on. Let my life end. He's at the end of his rope. So overwhelmed, so heavy. And listen to how God revealed himself to Elijah. 1 Kings 19, 11. God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord did what? Passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Get the picture. Elijah had seen God reveal himself in fire from heaven, in rain from the sky, in provision of food, miraculously. And now God revealed himself to Elijah in the sound of a low whisper, in a way he had not seen, heard before. And the way the Bible talks about that is the Lord passing by. So we have this picture this pattern in the Bible of God's people walking through storms and in the process, in the middle of the storm, getting a clearer picture of the glory and the grace and the power and the love of God in the middle of the storm as he passes by his people. So now here in the New Testament, in the middle of the storm at sea, The Spirit of God uses this language in the Word of God to describe Jesus walking on the water and he meant, he intended to pass by them. That takes on whole new meaning, doesn't it? Because now you realize Jesus meant, he intended to give these disciples in the middle of the storm a greater glimpse of his glory than they had ever seen before. That's exactly what happened. Did you notice verses 51 and 52? Jesus got in the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and the storm stopped, and they were utterly astounded. Why? Because they didn't understand about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. In other words, they had just seen Jesus perform a miracle, turning five loaves of bread and two fish into a meal for over 5,000 people, but they still didn't get it. They didn't realize who Jesus was until this moment. And it's interesting, in Matthew's account of this story, when Jesus gets into the boat, Matthew says... Uh, Those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. That's the first time in the Bible that the disciples realize and confess that Jesus is the Son of God, a title for God in the flesh. It was in the middle of the storm they came to that realization. In the middle of the storm, Jesus was revealing his glory and his grace and his power and his love in new ways, who he is, in such a way that 
we might realize in a deeper way who Jesus is. And in this, realize he is the one we most need in the middle of the storm. To realize that our greatest need in the storm is not strength or peace or hope or wisdom or courage or help or anything else. We need the one who's the source of all those things. Our greatest need is not for our circumstances to be fixed. As much as we want things to work out in this way or that way, our greatest need is the one who's sovereign over all our circumstances. We need Jesus. We need God in the flesh. What do you most need when the waves are rising around you? You need the one who speaks and causes the waves to be still. What do you most need when the wind is beating against you? You need the God who speaks and the wind stops. What do you most need in the middle of the storm? You need the God who's sovereign over the storm. Jesus is our greatest need in the storm. And here's the beauty in this story. So it leads you right in this next truth. Hear this from God to you. This God in the flesh, Jesus, is with you in the storm. He's with you. This God is with you. The one you most need is with you. So this is the sentence in the story that if we're not careful, can cease to shock us, especially if we've heard the story, read it many times. But verse 48 says, About the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. About the fourth watch of the night, in the darkest part of the night, when their energy was at its lowest, when their despair was at its deepest, Jesus showed up and he miraculously came to them where they were. And they realized Jesus had been watching them all along, and he was not for a second going to leave them alone. Can I just say that again? And you soak it in right where you're sitting. Maybe just make it a bit more personal. In the darkest part of your night, when your energy is at its lowest and your despair is at its deepest, Jesus will show up. And you will realize he has seen you all along. He has known you all along. And he is not about to leave you alone in that storm. Jesus is with you in the storm. Not distant from you. Right there with you. And you listen to verse 49. It gets even better. It says, when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they thought he, or actually it says it. They thought it was a ghost. So they cried out in fear, in terror. So and this is interesting. This is not a cry of faith. This is a cry of fear. There's essentially no faith in what they were saying. Yet Jesus comes to them anyway and listen to his language immediately. He speaks to them and says, take heart. It's I. Do not be afraid. What a beautiful picture of the mercy and kindness of Jesus to come to us where we are, even in our cries of fear, and to comfort us. Isn't this encouraging? Particularly on days when our faith is waning and maybe even non-existent. Instead, we're just afraid or we're confused or we're frustrated burdened or worried or anxious. And the truth is, we're lacking faith. Even in that moment, Jesus comes to us and says, take heart. It's I. I'm here. Don't be worried. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. I am with you. I'm with you. Even when we can't muster up that cry of faith, he's still pursuing us. And not only with us, but we can trust him. He's going to lead us through this. Next to the next to the last truth, Jesus will lead you through the storm. He will lead you through the storm. Jesus gets into the boat with him, and the wind ceases. And they cross over to the other side. 
It was a long night. It took us seconds to read this story. It was hours of, can we keep this up? How long is this going to last? Will this ever end? And finally, it ended. Now, here's the deal. I obviously do not know how your story or how the storms you're in now or you face in the future will unfold. And you don't know that either. But here's what I do know, and here's what you can know. For all who love and trust and worship God, you can know this. Jesus will lead you through to the end, and the end will be good. Amen. Guaranteed. Say, so, how can you say that? Well, it's straight from God. We know. We know that for those who love God, all things, all things, all things. In, in the original language of the New Testament, all things there means all things. All things work together for what? For good, for good, for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And what's that purpose? Ah, see the God who sees and knows from the beginning. Uh, God saw you way before this storm ever started, all the way back to before you were born. He foreknew you and predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son, to be renewed and restored into the image that you were made to experience life in. And those he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also what? Glorified. That's where it's all headed. Glory. Yes. Glory. It's where it's all going. So brother or sister in Christ, in the middle of the storm, take heart. There's a lot we don't know in the storm, but we do know this beyond the shadow of a doubt. For all who keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, trusting in Jesus, he will lead you through the storm. He will lead you through the storm. And not just you. That's the last truth. Part of me wants to stop right here. I just want to just soak this in in each of our lives, but it's not where the passage today stops. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this last truth. Not only will Jesus lead you through the storm, but Jesus is not just for you and your storms. He's for others and their storms. So our, our passage doesn't end with the disciples safe on the other side. It ends with more and more people who are sick being made well. Jesus is not just for you and your storms. He's for others and their storms. So have a different perspective this week as you go out into this world. Maybe in a similar way to what I was sharing at the beginning as pastor about to speak this word, to realize the people you're around all week long have needs in their lives. They're walking through challenges too. So other students, other friends of yours, on campus, at school, other coworkers, neighbors, that person waiting on you at the restaurant. These are people with needs in their lives and their families. And Jesus is for them in their storms. He's brought you across their path to be a reflection of his love for them, to point them to his love for them. So live with that perspective. In a world of need right around us, an urgent spiritual and physical need far beyond us, don't just receive this truth in your life. Spread this truth through your life. Amen. Don't just be comforted by Jesus in your life. Be committed to sharing Jesus' love with others' lives. Amen. We live to spread the good news of Jesus with you in the storm.